to worship. My name is Shelanie Voorhees, and I have the privilege um, of being the worship director here as well as the director of women's ministries. And I just want to let you know that we have um, some things happening in the life of our church. I have my notes right up here um, that, um, that we want to be aware of and, and working on together. And so that is my uh, privilege this morning is to get to bring those to you, both those of you who are here gathered in this room and those of you who are worshiping with us this morning online. Welcome to all of you. Would you do something for me this morning, please? There's a basket under the chair in front of you, and if you're online, then there's a comment section there, but if you're here in person, would you reach down into that basket and grab a connection card, please? Some of them look like this. Some of them look like this. I found a few different versions in the basket. Some of them look like this. So will everybody just go ahead and grab one of those? Did you find those in the basket there in front of you? Any, any version of them works. These are our communication cards, and these are the cards that we ask you to use to, to write on, to communicate with us so that we can be praying for you um, throughout the week so that we can know what your needs are and so that we, together as staff and elders here at the church, can help meet those needs Today I want to let you know about something really special before I get to sort of more of the nitty gritty of the announcements. And that is that we are heading into Holy Week this year. Into Palm, We're getting 
For me, it's like it's tomorrow because we're in full preparation mode. But we are looking in the month of April at Palm Sunday, Good Friday, and Easter Sunday. And church, we're looking at this as a, a type of an arc. And I don't mean that by a boat, but a, a rainbow-like shape, right? And this, this opportunity to bring the love and the compassion and the gospel of Jesus Christ to our community. And that's something that we want to do together. Amen? That the, that the ministers of the grace and the goodness of God are not the people that stand on this platform. It's we who sit in the pews, who sit in the chairs. You are the ministers of the grace and the goodness of God. There are so many ways um, for you to serve this year at Easter. And we want to encourage everyone to be serving, everyone to have a, a part in bringing the gospel to our community as we approach this week. And so... Um, one of the ways to do that is by singing in the choir. If that's something that's in your heart, it's not too late to join. Our choir rehearsals are on Wednesday evenings right here in this room at 6.30. I mean, if you are a, a singer, it's okay if you don't read music, but if you'd like to bring your voice and, and be part of that choir in the downtown city park, we invite you to come to rehearsal this coming Wednesday at 6.30 p.m. There will be any number of other ways to serve that Easter week as well, and I can't wait to bring those details Details to you for Pastor Mike and Kurt and our elders to, to tell you what's happening that week of Easter. But here's what I'd like for you to do, please. If you would, if you're interested in serving here um, at the church and in the downtown city park come Easter, will you just write that down on this communication card and write down, I'd like to be part of a service team. Somehow let us know, I'd like to serve. We're working right now on getting teams together that will do anything from setting up chairs to wipe it, wiping them down. They get wet overnight when we set them up in the downtown city park. Um, there'll be opportunities to sponsor chairs, possibly. There, there'll be lots of things that need to be done um, that week. So if you would like to serve, would you write down your name and maybe a contact, the best way to contact you, your email address would be wonderful, and we can get in touch with you about being part of a service team that week. And we're getting those together now, so that's why I'm bringing you that information. For those of you who have been giving here at First Baptist Church this last year, we want to let you know that your giving statements for the year are available out in the foyer, so we encourage you to pick those up today. Um, and that to remind you that we also have a giving um, venue, a, a, a way to give that's not just here in this church, but that's through our website, FBC Paso. Dot org. There's a drop-down menu there. You can click on that and click give, and that's, an, that's a great way um, to give to the work of the ministry here at First Baptist Church. Um, and then finally, one of our, our young student Sunday school teachers, Steve Brooks, would like to encourage those of you who have children in Sunday school to work through um, the lesson material that he hands out during the week with your kids, that that, that which he is teaching um, on Sunday is something that is meant to be a blessing to you and to your whole family throughout the week. So he just wanted to give you that encouragement as well. Okay, church, let's do what we love to do. Let's stand and let's sing.
statements of faith in that song. I got to go to the elder meeting this last week and we sang it together and Scott Peterson um, said, anytime you can use the word nigh in a song, you should sing it. Any, any opportunity. And Pastor Mike said, amen, that's the song. That song declares what it is together that we believe. He said, way better than the song Reckless Love. And I thought to myself, oh no, we're singing that song on Sunday. And he doesn't know it yet. We were singing both of them. <laughs> and that's because that word reckless has a connotation of being irresponsible, right? And so if we sing that God's love is reckless, then we might be tempted to think, oh, the Lord is irresponsible with his love. That he doesn't have concern for other people's uh, safety, that he's willing to, to let people be harmed. That's not what the songwriter meant by that word, though when he wrote it. Even still, the words, church, that we sing are important because they shape the way that we think. 
and the things that we believe about God and the things that our souls and our hearts affirm and enter into. We don't want there to be any stumbling block or anything you have to cross, any connotation you have to dismiss in order to sing a song. Because that which we declare about the Lord is to be true, amen? Amen. So here's, here are some words that I think that we can sing together in spirit and in truth. There's no shadow. There's no shadow you won't light up. Mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. No wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. Sing it again, no shadow. No shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. come forward for the offering. It is my pleasure to pray for us this morning. Man, what a song. Christ, our hope in life and in death. With that thought, let's go to prayer. Oh, Lord, we thank you so much for this day, and we thank you that you give us the privilege to gather together to lift your name on high to open your word, to examine who you are and how much you dearly love us. As the benefactors of your grace, Lord, we just we come and we praise you 
through song and through the attitudes of our heart and through the, the ministry of, of giving back to you what you've given to us. Lord, we acknowledge your sovereignty. We lift up uh, those among us that are, that are suffering from illnesses, whether it be COVID or other. Lord, we pray that they, as they go through this, they know that they have one that cares for them. We lift up Danny and Philippa, and we thank you for the sovereign work that you've done thus far, but we know that there's more work to be done to get them back to, to the Philippines. So we acknowledge that, and we, we hand that over to you. And Lord, I just think of the youth that are, that are up on the mountain right now, up at Hume. They'll be making their way back. I pray that this weekend, that the ones that n knew about you, that they've come into a saving relationship, and now they know you. And more importantly, you know them. God, as they come back, I pray that, that their lives would be different in a way that only you can make happen. We thank you for <clears throat> your sovereignty in, in all of the COVID tests that had to go on on Friday night or Thursday night, and each and every one of them came back negative. We pray this same thing for the senior highs at the end of February, God, that you would sovereignly r rule and reign over that, uh, that retreat as well, that you would have each and every person on that bus that you intend that they might come, get away from the craziness of life, and uh, come and meet you and be restored and renewed. Lord, we thank you now as we acknowledge you and who you are and who we are in you, Christ. We thank you for this, the, these funds. We pray that you would you know each and every need that we have in this church. We come to we, because we serve you. So we pray for your faithfulness in our hearts and our faithfulness in our giving. And we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.
would you just offer these to the Lord in prayer? Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever wilt be. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness, morning by morning new mercies I see, and all I have needed thy hand hath Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. All God's people said, amen, amen. May be seated. Well, we amen to that. Uh, let's see, kids, you need to make your way on to Junior Church. Follow Mr. McLaughlin that way. He's going to give you all the updates on the Rams 49ers game, and uh, you'll be doing Rams stickers, and you'll be praying for the Rams, and there'll be a lot of things good that are going on in there. The rest of you, grab your Bible, if you would, and open it up to Genesis chapter 9, the ninth chapter of the book of Genesis. We want to say uh, welcome back, Mr. Goodman. It's good to have you amongst us, among the living. <clears throat> He's doing much better after that knee surgery, so I'm next, Mike, so you're going to have to tell me all about it. And then, I think I saw David Hargrave. Is he here? Where is he? Raise your hand. He's sitting over there in the old man section. That's because it's his birthday today. So, happy birthday. Yeah. All right. You get officially retire now, Dave. Did you know that? I mean, even though you don't have any money, you, you reach the age where you can, I don't know, just... Senior Liberation Day. All right, good. Medicare recipient, the whole thing. All right, you got your Bible, open it up to the ninth chapter of the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 9. Is it um, warm in here? <laughs> Is it too cold? I'll leave it alone. Uh. My opening illustration is going to be a little controversial, but that's okay. What do you think of when you think of the rainbow flag? What comes to your mind? That's not controversial at all. A man by the name of Harvey Milk, who was a uh, supervisor, uh, first openly elected gay supervisor, or a politician really for that matter, in any political party who said that he was a part of the LBG. L G B I always get that wrong. L B G Q whatever the alphabet soup is, he's, he was a part of that, okay? And uh, he was open about it, and he wasn't just open, he was an advocate, a very strong advocate for it. Um, he commissioned a man by the name of Gilbert Baker to pioneer a symbol that would stand out so that when people saw it, they would understand the movement that he was involved in the movement of the gay and the lesbian people. And so he chose a rainbow. That was the symbol that he chose. Now, you might wonder if he actually knew what he was doing when he chose that rainbow, but the actual truth is, is he knew exactly what he was doing. He said to everybody, the rainbow's in the Bible. And the rainbow is a covenant between God and His creatures. Now, he doesn't say whether or not God approves of the practice of homosexuality, but he did understand that it was a promise of God. And when they asked him why he chose that, especially a biblical reference, he said, because God and only God knows the struggles of gay and lesbians, and only in God can they find hope. 
thought to myself, boy, there's more truth in that than he knows. Because it's true, God does understand their struggles. Some of them honestly feel that God made them that way and they're under compulsion and they can't do anything else. And they understand that they need a God. But my hope and my goal today is that when we see the flag, because it probably invokes all kinds of emotions in different people, that when we look at it, we wouldn't get angry. Angry and say, well, you took a Christian symbol and now you use it for your understanding of your distorted relationships. But rather, we would look at that symbol and we would say, thank God for His grace, because if it wasn't for His grace, we'd all be dead, straight and gay alike. I'm not saying that God approves of their practice, but what I am saying is that when I see a flag, I don't get mad. I say to myself, thank God he had patience with me. Thank God that he didn't destroy me in my sins. And though my sins are different than their sins, I'm still a sinner saved by grace. And I hope they come to realize someday the power of that symbol. That there's something far greater in this world than homosexuality. There's something far greater in human achievement. There's something far greater in this world than anything in and of it and that what it's made of. There's something called God. A beautiful being who created us, called us into existence, spoke this world into its being, and He sent His Son to die for our sins. I hope that someday they will bow every form of pride, whether it's pride of man or gay pride, will fall to their knees and understand the beauty and the power of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, the rainbow has a powerful symbol. It displays the glory of God throughout Scripture. Ezekiel put it this way, like the appearance of the bow, that would be the rainbow, that is in the cloud on the day of rain, so was the appearance and the brightness all around, such as an appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And I love this. I saw it and I fell on my face. The book of Revelation, John says, and he who sat there had the appearance of jasper and carnelian. And around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. There it is in the midst of worship and the glory of God. Revelation says this, and I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven, wrapped in a cloud with a rainbow over his head and his face like the sun and his legs like pillars of fire. The rainbow is the display of the glory of God and the grace of God towards humanity. So let's look at our text of Scripture this morning, beginning in chapter 9, verse 8. We'll read down through verse 17, and we'll understand some powerful things that God has to say about His bow that He sets in the cloud. Verse 8, Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, Behold, I establish my covenant with you and your offspring after you, and with every living creature that is with you, the birds the livestock, and every beast of the earth with you, as many came out of the ark, for it is every beast of the earth. I establish my covenant with you that never again shall all, you like that, never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood, and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, this is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. Verse 13, I have set my bow in the cloud and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. I will bring clouds over the earth and the bow is seen in the clouds. I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh and the water shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the clouds, 
I will see it, and I will remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. And God said, this is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. Amen to that. Uh, when you read this passage of Scripture, it says over seven times in the text, and you can just circle them if you want in your Bible, but it's this word that continues to repeat, covenant, 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 over and over again. It's because God is establishing here the first of several different covenants that will happen in the Bible. Most people do not understand what a covenant is, and they don't give much thought to it. But the idea of a covenant is something that is very, very significant. Uh, simply put, we can simply say that a covenant is a chosen relationship between two parties who make binding promises to each other. Binding promises are made and they are meant to be kept by both parties. That is what would be a bilateral covenant. Now, you may understand this in the sense because you, many of you, have entered into a bilateral covenant. You're married. When you get married, you come and you say, I will do such and such, and she will do such and such. And if I'm the one who married you, I will say words like, do you promise and covenant before God and these witnesses to be your faithful, loving husband and wife? And then I spell it out for better or for worse, for richer, for poor. And if you're married, you're poor. But I've also said for life and death. The new trend in marriage today is to write your own vows and make them whatever you want. And I do allow couples to write their own vows, but I don't allow them to change any part of that statement because it is a covenant relationship between you and God and your partner. A covenant relationship that's set, set apart based on that relationship, not like a contract. You see, a contract is, uh, can be impersonal. There doesn't have to be a relationship behind it. It's non-relational. But a covenant, like marriage, is a chosen relationship that you decided to enter in of your free will voluntarily, binding yourself to promises and obligations. In the ancient world, it was not uncommon to enter into many covenants, and it didn't have to be people of equal authority. A king could enter into covenant with people that were less than himself, and he was then going to be responsible for committing and making promises to his subjects. But all covenants are not the same. In fact, divine covenants that are covenants by God are uniquely different. For one, we're nowhere equal to God. And so when we enter into a covenant with God, it's more like God binding a promise on Himself of what He will do rather than what we will do. The reason is, is because we're pretty good at breaking our word at everything that we say. How many of you ever made a promise to God? How many of you have broken that promise to God? You've told God, I'll never do that again. And then the very next day you're in there eating chocolate bonbons when you said that you would not. But God makes a covenant. And when God makes a covenant, it's a unilateral covenant. It's a covenant that He says, this is what I will do. And I'm so thankful that He does that. Because even though that covenant can be likened to a marriage, those who were in Israel were like an unfaithful prostitute, an unfaithful wife and a prostitute, like in the book of Hosea. The Jews could never keep their faithfulness to God. But don't be slamming them. We as Gentiles haven't done much better either. And that's why God has to come in and says, I will be your God and you will be my people. It's a decision that God has made, a covenant that He has made. Some people, when you talk about covenants in the Bible, even today get really upset. They really get angry. How dare God come down and choose these Jews? Who does he think he is? God. He has every right to choose the Jewish people. He has chosen them. He didn't choose the Philistines. He didn't choose the Palestinians. That really gets people upset when I get going on that one. But I don't care what your political point of view is. When God says that they're going to be my people and I chose them, then you don't have anything to say about it. 
It's best to shut your mouth and go with what God says. The Hebrew idea and the notion of covenant, bereath karath, to cut a covenant is the term there. It spoke of by God where God Himself chooses to uphold both ends of the covenant. He is sovereign in the administration of His will. He is unequal to anybody who is around it. He is the one who fulfills the covenant and promises, and He is the great covenant maker and peacemaker of all. He guarantees fulfillment by His word for His name's sake. See, most people, when they think about a covenant to God or a promise that they're going to make to God, they think it's some kind of a bilateral contract. You ever been in a sticky situation financially or maybe a a risky situation where your life and death were hanging in the balance? And you say things like, God, if you get me out of this mess, I promise I'm going to do this for you. We've all done things like that. I was in the sixth grade. I tried to make a bilateral covenant with God. I said, God, if you just give me Megan Bundy as my girlfriend, I will serve you in Sunday school to the day I die. That was the highest form of service that I could think of was Sunday school. Actually, the only reason why I chose Megan Bundy because when you lined up all the students and all the kids in the class, she was the only girl that I was taller than. And that's why she got chosen. You can't have a girlfriend that's taller than you. That, that rule's thrown out the window these days. But that shows you what my head was thinking. And I'm glad God didn't enter into a bilateral contract with me because I got something much greater than Megan Bundy. Amen? If you're like a man like me, you married out of your league. The woman that you married is far more superior than you to you. You're nothing more than a dumb ox. Just kidding, guys. Little humor gone too far. Sorry about that. But God makes us a covenant. He promises to us, just as He promised Noah. In fact, as you move through the Word of God, you're going to discover that God makes a lot of of covenants. We're going to look at sometimes in the future the Abrahamic covenant, a promise that he makes to Abraham. We're going to look at a Mosaic covenant called the, the law that he's going to give to Moses. We're going to look at a covenant that he gives to David, the Davidic covenant. And the best covenant of all covenants, a covenant that you and I are the recipient of, is called the new covenant. And it's a beautiful thing. Well, let's look at this covenant here for just a moment. First of all, I want you to understand that this covenant, as I said earlier, is not bilateral, but it's unilateral. It's God who chose it, God who made it, God who is sovereign, and when He uh, establishes a sovereign deal, that's just how it is and how it's going to be. You fight against it, kick against it, complain, but it doesn't do any good. God is the winner every time. Second of all, the covenant is eternal. Notice this one in Noah's life. This is a covenant, he says in verse 12, between me and you and every living creature for all future generations. Simply put, that I am going to bring to you this covenant, and it's a covenant between you, people, and the earth, and it's going to go on forever. As long as there is an earth, it's going to be there. Verse 16, when the bow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature on the face of the earth. God sees that bow in the clouds. God sees that, and it's a reminder to him after the rain that he will never, ever again flood the earth and completely wipe out mankind. Yeah, we'll have floods. Yeah, we'll have rain. Yes, we'll have hard times, but I'm not going to envelop the earth in water and destroy it. And I give you my promise to do that. Next, third of all, you'll notice that the covenant is also universal and unconditional. Behold, I establish my covenant, he says in verse 9, with you and all the offspring after you, with every living creature, with the birds, the livestock, as many of you who has came out of the ark from every beast of the earth, I establish my, my contract with you that I will never again shall I cut flesh off with waters of flood. God promises unconditionally 
for no good reason other than his grace and his mercy and his love that this is what I will do for you because it is a binding contract that I'm setting myself to. I can thank God for that over and over again because when I'm looking at my news feed or I'm watching a TV program and I see things in this world that just drive me crazy going on and I get angry and I get mad, I get mad at murder, I get mad at rape, I get mad at sinners getting away with common crime. And I want to say, God, when are you going to come down and exercise some justice around here? Good night. We need it and we need it now. Well, don't forget, God will, in His time, the wheels of justice are always turning with God and they're never late. He will exercise His justice, but in the meantime... God gives every single one of us common grace. Common grace is a beautiful thing because it is the delay, it is the mitigation of God's wrath upon us where He instantly could have come down and said, that's it, you're gone. I mean, He could have done that to Adam and Eve. He could have said, you know what, I gave you guys the rules. I said you could have everything in the garden. And man, it was a beautiful place. And I set you in it, my provision, my care. You didn't even have an inclination. You had a complete free will that I gave to you. You didn't know what sin tasted like. You'd never been tempted. You could have followed me in all the days of your life and lived in paradise. But no, you chose to eat of the fruit which was forbidden. And because of that, you incurred my wrath and the death sentence. But I'm glad God didn't kill them. I'm glad He gave them grace. God gives to us common grace for those who are sinners, even though the Word of God tells us that the wrath of God abides upon those of us who are not living in His grace. The wrath of God, Romans 1.18, tells us abides on this earth, yet instead of Him immediately unleashing His wrath towards sinners and calling for a reckoning of judgment, He allows common grace to be found. And that's beautiful because if it wasn't for His common grace, you and I wouldn't be here. Common grace gives sinners the opportunity to hear the gospel. Common grace gives us sinners the opportunity to respond. Common grace allows us to fumble in the darkness until God wakens us up and His Spirit impinges and quickens upon the human heart and makes us alive in Christ and our eyes are open to behold the gospel. And then we believe and we trust and we come to faith and we repent and we are gloriously saved in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Common grace is a good thing. That doesn't mean, as Greg Allison says, common it means the same measure for all extended to everyone. No, some people are going to get more grace than others. Some people are going to receive a better slice of the pie. It doesn't mean that they're more respected or loved by God. It just means that God is allowed in His goodness for them to experience even His blessings in the middle of their sin. And by common, we don't mean that it's dull or it's ordinary. In fact, every time I look around and I look at the achievements that man has done, the buildings we've built, the farming that we've done, the medical advancements, as he says, the artistic genius, when I see the beauty of a, a loving family, when I see global initiatives that are set forth, trying to do the best they can to stop evil pros prospering in the world, I thank God for common grace. I was on the island of New Britain, my wife and I, and we were scouting out a location for His healing hands. And as we were sitting there in the hotel, kind of a hotel, kind of not a hotel, third world country, you never know what you're going to get. But they had a big giant conference room, and we decided to go into that conference room, I did, and sat down just to kind of see what was going on. There was about 25 people in there, and there were 25 people who had gathered from New Britain who were concerned about human trafficking, and we're doing all they can to rescue girls that were being sold into the sex slave market. And though they weren't believers and though they knew not Christ, I thanked God for their initiative. 
In fact, the next day I came there and they found out who I was and they said, would you pray for us? And I said, absolutely, I would pray. What you're doing is a good thing. And I pray that in God's goodness and his graces, he would not only alleviate the suffering of those who experience this, but they would experience the greatest joy of all and experience liberation by being freed in Christ. But I want you to also notice, not only is this a unilateral covenant, an eternal covenant, this covenant is given to us by a sign. He says, I'm going to give you a sign. God gave us the very first rainbow. It doesn't say anywhere else in the Bible that it had rained prior to this. And it isn't if God is borrowing the rainbow. I believe in the whole, cons- uh, I should say, the grand scheme of things that probably the earth was in somewhat of a canopy, and then after the flood, I believe the earth was rotated on its axis, and the mountain ranges became more distinct, and the seasons became very clear, whereas before he would have watered it by a canopy, he's now going to allow rain, and in that rain, there's going to be a bow, and in that bow, it's going to be a symbol and a sign of a promise of God. I give you my promise. In fact, sometimes in your translation of your Bible, you'll notice the simple word bow used over and over again. Now, if you have like an NIV Bible, because they try to reach dynamic equivalency, they will use the word rainbow. But the simple word here that is used is just simply a bow. It's a sign. It's also a sign of a warrior. That's what a bow was used for. And because this incredible display of colors that goes from one end to another, is shaped like a bow, it's given that name, and we call it a rainbow. And you might say, well, rainbows, those are beautiful things. I mean, we know exactly what they are, the water droplets that are after the rain that still remain in the atmosphere, and when the sunlight hits those water droplets, it forms a prison and gives us all of those different colors. And I don't know if you know this, but you have to stand exactly at 42 degrees to be able to see a rainbow. If you're standing at 15 degrees or you're standing at 45 degrees, you will not see the rainbow. You have to be standing at exactly 42 degrees to look at that rainbow to be able to actually see it. Now, I can tell you that mathematically, I can tell you that scientifically, but who really cares about that? Rainbows were not meant to be scientifically analyzed. They were meant to be enjoyed as a promise of God. I remember one day I was at the dairy. I was doing my job and checking loads and getting everything ready, and supervisor tapped me on the shoulder and said, put your clipboard down, you gotta come with me. Where are we going? We're going to the ice cream department. Somebody didn't show up there, so I need you to work in the ice cream department. Okay, so I went into the ice cream department. And as you might imagine, it's cold in there, very cold. So I wore this fur park, and I said, well, what's my job? He says, I want you to stand at this dispenser here. This dispenser is going to foam up, and it's going to bring down and fill up a three-gallon tub of ice cream. And your job is to take that tasting spoon and lightly dip it into the mix and taste it to make sure that it tastes like it should. If it's chocolate, it should taste chocolate. If it's strawberry, it should taste strawberry. If it's Rocky Road, you should be able to see marshmallows and all kinds of things floating around in there. Oh, that was a good job. I was tasting the Rocky Road ice cream as it would foam up and then watch the machine put a cap on it as it was moving down the line. I thought, "Mm, this is a kind of a job for me. I was built for this. And so I sat there and tasted every half gallon of ice cream that went by, and in this case, a three-gallon container. You know, they don't do ice cream in half gallons anymore. You buy a quart and a half. That's because ice cream has gone up in price, and They don't want you to know about it, so we'll just give you a little less ice cream. Secret of the trade. But after I was there for about 20 minutes, another guy tapped me and says, no, he needs you over there. No, I want to stay here. No, you go over there. And I went over there, and there was another guy who was actually blending the ingredients, milk and cream and sugar and everything else. And then he began to describe to me all the emulsifiers that were going into the ice cream. 
I didn't want to hear about it. But emulsifiers are very important because without emulsifiers, those liquids will not suspend marshmallows and nuts and chocolate chips in your ice cream. They'll all go to the bottom if you don't have emulsifiers in them. How would you like to get a, a bucket of chocolate chip ice cream and it's all vanilla at the top and the last layer is just nothing but chocolate chips that have sunk to the bottom? You wouldn't like it. And as he was describing to me the process in way too much detail, I turned to him and I said, you know, I don't think it was meant for me to know how to make ice cream. I think God just wants me to enjoy ice cream. I'm going back to my old station and taste. Amen? Amen. Well, rainbows are like that. They're meant to be enjoyed. They're symbols of God's covenant and a sign to you of His grace to all people. In fact, as we make our way through the Bible, we will find not only are there going to be a, a covenant to Noah, there'll be an Abrahamic covenant, a, a Mosaic covenant, a Davidic covenant. But probably the most precious to all of us is this, a new covenant. You see, whereas in the Noahic covenant, it gives us the ability to remain living while God does not destroy us. It gives us common grace, the new covenant God enters into a special relationship to us where we're fundamentally changed, where we're no longer under that which was a part of the Old Testament, but we're under the magnificent grace of Jesus Christ because the price of that new covenant was the blood of Jesus and it has been declared and paid for by Him. And we like they in the Old Testament are a recipient of a new covenant that comes to us by faith. Here's what Jeremiah says. He says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel, with the house of Judah. Not like a covenant I made with their fathers on the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. Why? They broke it. I was their husband, declares the Lord. And Israel was so unfaithful. But now he says, for this covenant that I will make with the house of Israel, which is going to include Jews and Gentiles, declares the Lord. Listen to this. I will put my law within them. It's beautiful. There's something old and something current and something future in the new covenant. And the old part of the new covenant is that the law of God will be written on my heart in a powerful way, and I will desire to do it. I will write it on their hearts. God is going to say, your desires are now going to be in Christ with the Spirit of God in me, to live as a new man and to want to obey me, where before it was hard for you to do now, because of the power of my Spirit within you, you will be able to live in a life of obedience. Not perfect. That will be yet in the future. We will be, I will be their God and they shall be my people. And look at this, verse 34, no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and say, know the Lord, for they will all know me. Isn't that good? We, the community of the church, know the Lord. And yet there's a future part of this covenant. Even though I'm speaking to you as the church, I know there are people here who still do not know the Lord. There's wheat among the tares. There's sheep and goats. But one of the beautiful things about the new covenant is that we as the people of God can bind together those of us who know Him and love Him. And we belong to Him. And He is ours. And we have that fellowship and that bond as brother and sister in Christ that is the strongest bond on the face of the earth. And He says, From the least to the greatest declares the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sins no more. Aren't you glad for that? God does not have a good memory when it comes to our sin. Not meaning that He can't recall it if He wants to, but He chooses by His active will to never bring it up because it's under the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Every time we gather as a church, we celebrate that new covenant when we have communion. And the night he's betrayed, he breaks bread and gives it to his disciples. And he says, do this in remembrance of me. And then he says, this is my body, which is for you. Verse 25, in the same way he took the cup after supper, saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood. We are recipients of a new covenant. And by the way, may I simply say this, it's not only new 
and past and yet future to be fulfilled. It is also eternal. Look at what he says in Hebrews. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, that when the greater and more perfect tent not made with hands, that is not of this creation. He entered once and for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by the means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. Amen to that. It's a covenant that we enter into chosen of by him. I love this. All that the Father gives to me shall come to me, and the one who comes to me I will certainly not cast out. It comes by faith, and faith comes by hearing, and hearing comes by the word of Christ. And this eternal covenant that is given to us by God, chosen, elected, sovereignly predestined by God, means that we will shall be a recipient of that new covenant. We shall ever, ever more be His. For this is the will of my Father, Jesus says, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in Him may have eternal life. And I myself will raise him up on the last day. Amen. John 10 says, My sheep hear my voice and I know them, and they shall follow me. And I give eternal life to them and they shall never perish. No one shall snatch them out of my hand. My Father who gives them to me is greater than all and no one who is able, no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand and I and the Father are one. Some people say, Pastor Mike, don't you get angry when the LBGQT, whatever community, uses the rainbow flag? No. Because when I look at it, I see the patience of God. God is allowing them to live even though what they're doing, He absolutely abhors. He doesn't destroy them right away. But it's a promise, and I pray that someday they will understand the fullness of the promise, that there is a God out there who loves them beyond they, what they could even imagine. A God who is gracious and patient and kind. A God who loves, but a God whose anger will not be restrained forever. And I pray that they would find the real meaning of that bow and understand that there's a God who loves all of us, every single one of us are born sinners and we need the grace of God. I'll close simply with the great theologian, Lucy and Linus. In this case, Linus is the theologian. Lucy's looking out the window and she says, boy, look at the rain. What if it floods the whole world? Linus, the scholar, It'll never do that. In the ninth chapter of Genesis, God promised Noah that it would never happen again. And the sign of the promise is the rainbow. Amen, right? Lucy says, you've taken a great load off my mind. Linus says, sound theology has a way of doing that. (laughs) Amen? Amen? My friends, the sound theology this morning is this, is that you are loved by God. And He has promised to be good to you. And He loves you and His grace is given to you and you will forever be His. You are assured eternally of His grace. Amen? Do you remember that old hymn we used to sing? Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine. I think we need to sing that, shall we? Can you whip it up there on the piano kind of quick? Let's all stand and sing it. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine.
Is that your story? Is that your song? If it is, then let's praise Him all day long. There's nobody like the Lord who loves you in His grace, who sent His Son to you to die on that cross. And by His blood, you have been cleansed and washed and made new. Thank you, Father. Lord, we ask a blessing on your people today. May the truth of your word, its grace, its covenant, its promises that have been given to us and to our children, may you bless us in the fullness of them today. I pray if there's someone here today who doesn't know the Lord, that today might be a day that they come to know you. Today would be a day when that becomes their song and their story, and they will praise you for all the days of their life. Bless us now as your people. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, we got Sunday school, Dr. Frankel's class, Revelation downstairs, coffee, donuts, everything.